So last week I clicked on the first video on my series on the Russian Navy and, well, to be honest, I couldn't listen to it for long. I am very sorry I put you all through that absolute horror show that looks like it was made on a potato and sounds like I was sitting neck deep in a human-sized jar of Vegemite. So without further ado, and given the fact that my new PC has finally arrived and I can put this up in 4K, I present to you the Voyage of the Second Pacific Squadron, the Voyage of the Damned, with some new bits, but most importantly, new audio. I wanted to celebrate getting close to 50k and really sort of hitting that milestone that I was uh, I originally set out to hit when I first started. So thank you all. Um, I will put this out as soon as I have it finished. And well, all I can say is, and then it got worse. Boats. They're kind of cool. They do cool things and they allow countries to be big boys on the world stage. But Russia, they never really got the whole Navy thing down well with a few exceptions. From there, it's, well, a litany of utter incompetence, disaster, and misery. Right up through the Russian Imperial Navy, the Soviet Navy, and into the modern Russian Navy, which you can draw parallels between all three services as they are built off the same bricks. So hold on to your hats, get a drink, sit down, because as you all know, and as the saying goes when it comes to Russian naval history, and then it got worse. Imagine if you will, your countrymen have been attacked. They are under siege in the far off Port Arthur, and only you, in Europe, can sail to their rescue. The brave Variag fought valiantly, ambushed by a superior force, and has been lost. But you must get there quickly, because without your help, it is all going to go wrong. This is the exact position that the Russian Baltic fleet found itself in during the Russo-Japanese War in October 1904. The Tsar had sent Admiral Makarov, a very capable officer and quite possibly the best Admiral Russia had ever produced, to the Far East, and he began to turn things around very, very quickly. However, he was, um, decapitated when the Petropavlovsk hit a mine. It's a bit morbid. Enter stage right Admiral Zinoy Petrovich Roshosvensky, also known by his nickname Mad Dog, a man who I feel so sorry for that I want to give him a hug at about 73 pints of vodka. Under Roshosvensky's command, a large fleet was accumulated in St. Petersburg and the surrounding naval bases for a voyage to the Far East with the intention of smashing the Japanese fleet, pushing into Port Arthur, and winning the war with a resounding Ruhu, Russia numero uno. This was going to be about as clear and decisive a victory as the Imperial Russian Navy's even more mentally unstable successor, its campaign in the Black Sea against Ukraine. But ignoring that, Russian ships at the time had a short range. They were mostly built to French designs, the battleships at least. There were some native designs as well and also built in US yards, but the battleships, the core of them being the Borodino class, were built to French tumble-home designs at the time. Suffice to say, they're not the most buoyant. Russia also had no refueling ports between Europe and Asia, the Asian port itself being, you know, Port Arthur, the one that's under siege. Russian ships were all designed for Russian waters. Shocking, I know. You know, cold places. But that wasn't important, it was time to smack Japan silly and win the war. The greatest thing that the Russian Navy had going for it was Admiral Roshosvensky, and the fact that he wasn't corrupt, which is somewhat an ingrained tradition in the Russian naval command structure. And he was actually competent. This again is somewhat of a rarity in Russian upper command structures, totally wild. A Russian commander who isn't incompetent? Say it ain't so. And Admiral Roshosvensky would also beat senseless, yes with his fist, anyone who severely annoyed him or mildly ticked him off. And so, on the 15th of October 1904, 45 Russian ships with chartered freighters following them set sail for the Far East. Well, west. They had to go west first to go east. It's a whole thing, don't worry, look at the map. However, before the ships even left, the new battleship Orel, Eagle, had a worker remove a panel in its hull and go home for the night. Ignoring the fact that boats do in fact need to be watertight, the ship promptly sank at its mooring, just for fun, too, there was a second ship in the squadron, also called Orel, for reasons. So the fleet sets sail, a fleet including ironclads, modern pre-dreadnoughts, an aristocratic yacht with a gun bolted to it, a hospital ship, an icebreaker, which is going to the tropics, okay, and a smattering of new and newish cruisers, including the very sexy Aurora, which I will take any chance I can to show off on this channel. Oh, and by the way, these crews were mostly conscripts from central Russia, you know, the famously aquatic central Russia, and most had never even seen the sea before. 
and they were commanded by captains who would like to anger their ships behind cruisers so they could leave and go and get drunk for the night without Roshesvensky noticing. These ships were provided with enough ammunition for a major battle with a little extra. So gunnery practice, not necessary and not expected. The ships left harbour, or well, some of them, the flagship immediately ran aground and a cruiser lost an anchor, no idea how, and a destroyer rammed a battleship, but the ships finally left harbour. And then as the fleet was beginning to pass Denmark, a crisis happened. Random sailors began to start screaming that they were all doomed because Japanese torpedo boats were waiting near Sweden to kill them all. Geography not being a Russian strong suit even to this day. And so the fleet then began accidentally ramming Danish coal ships trying to refuel them. And another ship had a lifeboat fall off. Just, it just fell off. The icebreaker then proceeded to be handled so poorly and flopping around so much in the sea that Russia Svensky started shooting at it to send it home. We have not passed Jutland in Denmark yet. Now, some people try and defend this insanity by pointing out that the ships of the Imperial Japanese Navy at the time were all largely built in Britain. This is true. However, I challenge you in secret to crash build a fleet of torpedo boats and ship crews from Japan to Britain to man them in 1905 before the 2nd Pacific Squadron has sailed, which it sailed on, essentially crash sailing through an emergency. It's not exactly going to work. Admiral Roshesvensky would then try to calm everyone down by giving the simple order that no vessel should be allowed to get in amongst the fleet. This order went out just as a fishing vessel carrying messages from the Tsar arrived to tell Roshesvensky that he had been promoted. None of the warships, who the majority of which started shooting at said fishing boat, came close to hitting it, and the fishing boat's captain, reportedly, wasn't aware he was being shot at. The repair ship Kamchatka proceeded to declare she was being attacked on all sides by eight torpedo boats. Nobody else saw them. Kamchatka proceeded to say, oh, they went away because we turned. Because famously, small boats stop attacking you if you turn away. Maybe the Black Sea Fleet should try that. More on Kamchatka later. The fleet began to close in on Dogger Bank, and then it finally happened. Torpedo boats. The fleet immediately turned to fire, all guns blazing, shells raining from the heavens with multiple ships reporting that they had been torpedoed, and their crewmen laying on the deck preparing for the ships to sink. Crewmen ran around the decks, fighting off boarders, firing pistols, and swinging their swords. The battleships at last damaged four of their targets, and they even sank one. Victory was finally at hand. At last, the Variag and the defeats in the east would be finally avenged. However, two of the damaged targets were the Aurora and the Dmitri Donskoy, decidedly not Japanese, and the rest were British trawlers from Hull. Many of the ships had fired off all their ammunition and hit nothing. The British public was so annoyed that they wanted a war because they could not believe someone could be so monumentally stupid and pig-headed and that this was in fact an accident. The entire Royal Navy in Europe was put on standby, and they outnumbered the Russians at least four to one, with Admiral Beresford commenting that he would only use four battleships to sink the Russian fleet based on the calor of their gunnery, as any more would be simply unfair. Admiral Roshesvensky decided that it was maybe time to leave European waters, but he did dock first and ditch as many horribly useless officers as possible, including a particular captain who he wanted to beat senseless on the bridge of his flagship a couple days earlier. He went back to St. Petersburg to get reinforcements. The fleet then split, with the older ships going through the Mediterranean, via the Suez Canal, and the newest and fastest Russian ships going around the Cape, with both fleets then meeting in Madagascar. The Kamchatka now appeared, saying she had been attacked constantly, and fired 300 shells against three Japanese ships. These Japanese ships included a Swedish merchantman, a French merchantman, and a German trawler. She didn't hit anything. Oh, and as the fleet left Tangier, a ship broke the underwater telegraph cable with its anchor. So, you know... Tangier could now no longer talk to its ruling colonial capital city. Given that Kamchatka had done her level best to start a war with three out of the four largest naval powers on Earth, the United States being the only one that wasn't included, Rossesvensky now decided the Kamchatka best stay close to the flagship, so he could periodically scream at it and throw his binoculars at it. To avoid constant refueling, the Russian ships would store coal quite literally everywhere, including crew quarters, corridors, pretty much if you've got an empty pillowcase, you're putting coal on it. And therefore, the ships would be turned into fuel air bombs. And remember how the ships were designed for the cold. Believe it or not, it's quite hot in Africa. And crewmen would then start dying from the coal dust that was literally everywhere, including inside their lungs. A storm suddenly hit the fleet and out of nowhere, Kamchatka said alarmingly, Do you see torpedo boats? Near Africa. At about this point, Admiral Rossesvensky began to develop nicknames for ships and captains who particularly pissed him off. 
Some highlights include the slutty old geezer, the brainless nihilist, also known as Twitter, and other colourful ones including the lecherous slut, aka the artist formerly known as Kamchatka. When a ship particularly annoyed Rossespensky, he put it in the naughty corner, aka he just put it behind the flagship, and proceeded to and proceeded to use a yieldy microphone to scream at the ship while throwing binoculars at them. His staff had thankfully bought 50 pairs, and it is said to this day you can track the progress of the fleet across the bottom of the ocean by finding binoculars. That, that is a joke. Someone will take that literally. That's a joke. As Rossespensky's squadron grounded Cape Town, he found that the captain, who he had managed to piss off back to St. Petersburg, was coming with reinforcements in the form of the 3rd Pacific Squadron, which was entirely comprised of ships known as the Sink by Themself Squadron. Rossespensky proceeded to refuse to tell anyone where he was, so that they would not be able to rendezvous or find him in the slightest. The Admiral in charge of the 3rd Pacific Squadron therefore received the following order. You are to rendezvous with Admiral Rossesvensky, whose route is currently unknown to us. Right about now, the ships were passing South Africa, and the British commander in Durban warned the Russians, just in case they got a little scared, that British fishing boats were out and about. Just, you know, just to avoid them being scared senseless. The news filtered through as the ships arrived in Madagascar that Port Arthur had surrendered and the Russian ships there had been sunk. This was a tremendous blow to morale. But now, it's quiz time. Will the Russian fleet in Madagascar do the following? A. Wait patiently. B. Relax their crews and train a bit. C. Start a floating zoo, including having poisonous snakes attacking the crew, a crocodile on board, and a collection of monkeys while also doing exercises and accidentally shooting the aurora during a funeral for a dead crew member. If you got C, you win a bicky. Somebody sent Admiral Rossesvensky a parrot at this point, and the parrot proceeded to learn every single swear word in the Russian language, while the flagship itself was overrun with chameleons. I suppose at least you wouldn't be able to see them, so if you pretend really hard, the problem just sort of goes away. The poor Aurora became so full of creatures that the crew was refusing to sleep due to a fear of becoming food. At about this point, the fleet's cold storage broke down, and hundreds and tons of rotting meat was thrown overboard. This therefore added the aquarium to the floating circus sitting in the harbour, as it attracted all manner of sharks and other sea creatures. Admiral Rossesvensky would get very, very sick around now, and his chief of staff would proceed to have a brain hemorrhage. Stress definitely not being a factor, and as the old saying goes, their injuries were definitely not service-related. So the ship stayed in harbour, and every single STD known to humanity became commonplace amongst the fleet. But don't worry, it got a lot worse, as religious zealotry, mental breakdowns, and revolutionary talk became commonplace throughout the fleet. One crew member proceeded to start walking around the decks naked, asking everyone if they feared death in his best Davy Jones impression, albeit with less tentacles. Rossesvensky would recover, somehow, mentally he's probably gone at this point, but he discovered that many of his officers were absolutely off their faces on opium and other hard drugs, you know, Madagascar being the core of this trade at the time. It is unknown whether this addiction improved their performance or not, the bar being, in fact, incredibly low. Finally, a supply ship arrived with ammunition. And never mind, it's 12,000 winter boots and coats. In Madagascar. Lemurs were starting to get a little out of hand at this point on Aurora, who somehow undertook a competent boat race with her lifeboats. Aurora, in general, is an example of competency during this fleet, and honestly, it did not deserve this shit. What Aurora goes through makes me understand why it started the bloody revolution. More friendly fire later, including a nearly torpedoing of a destroyer and a signal from Kamchatka saying, oh no, I am sinking, probably making everyone happy, and finally the fleet would leave port. The ships then met with the Admiral Gorchakov, excitedly ready for letters from home. The crew then discovered that the letters that they had sent from Madagascar aboard the freighter were still there. The freighter having gotten lost, sailing in a big circle, and then coming back. Sadly, the inevitable happened on the 11th of November 1905. The 3rd Pacific Squadron found Rossesvensky near Vietnam. And oh boy, they were even more useless. Rossesvensky was completely at his wit's end at this point. He wanted to resign. He begged to resign. He, he was completely done. And the Tsar promptly said no. To the Tsar's credit, this was a doomed endeavour, and Rossesvensky was quite literally the one chance they had of even surviving, so I understand why he said no. The ships then sailed north together for battle with the Japanese, and promptly were absolutely slaughtered. 5,045 dead, 803 injured, 6,016 captured, 
Six battleships sunk, one coastal battleship sunk, 14 other ships sunk, two battleships captured, two coastal battleships captured, one destroyer captured, six ships disarmed, and much, much more damage throughout the fleet. Some ships would escape, taking shelter in the Philippines, controlled by the United States at the time, and some of these captured ships and sunk ships would actually be put back into Japanese service throughout the First World War. The Variag that I mentioned earlier ended back up in Japanese service, and then it was actually sold back to the Russians, quite interestingly, but never made it back due to the revolution. To their credit, some ships would fight incredibly hard, and they put up such a stiff resistance against almost unbeatable odds that, as I mentioned, they were able to get away. But the reality was that any hope of victory was so far gone, it's not even funny. In 1906, Rossosvensky faced a court-martial for the disaster, along with each of his surviving battleship commanders. Some of these commanders were sentenced to prison, and some to a firing spree, either losing the battle or surrendering on the high seas to the Japanese. Rossosvensky, wounded and rendered unconscious for most of the battle, was naturally reluctant to accept responsibility for the fiasco, but yet again, proving his immense character, Rossosvensky defended his subordinate commanders, who in many cases did not deserve the defence, and maintained total responsibility for the action, pleading guilty to losing the battle, and opening himself up to the firing squad. The Tsar would commute the captain's death sentences in a show of mercy. Rossosvensky would later pass away from a heart attack on the 14th of April, 1909, not even 10 years after the battle. It isn't known exactly what caused his heart attack, but I would take a bet on any day of the week that he would have lived longer if he did not have to go through this complete comedy of errors. And if you think this is a one-off in history, oh boy, do I have news for you. See the attached playlist that this will be going into. The issues that face the 2nd Pacific Squadron are endemic of the Russian Navy, the Soviet Navy, and the Navy of the Russian Federation. And this is something that a lot of people, including my detractors, don't seem to understand. You can point out similar comedies of errors that have occurred in Western navies, such as the British Navy's HMS Captain, the Thresher, the Scorpion, all of these issues happening in the US Navy. But you have to go decades and decades and decades back to find them. This fiasco happened in 1905. The Mosfa was not in 1905. The Loshiak was not in 1905. The K-19 was not in 1905. There are so many errors. There's so many screw-ups. The Kuznetsov was not in 1905. The brutal honesty is, the Russian Navy fucking sucks. Thank you again for your support on my way to reaching 50,000 subscribers. I hope this upload goes a ways to remedying the original, and I thank you all for watching the original, because I'm not going to lie, I probably wouldn't have watched it with how bad that audio was, and I made it, so I can't thank you all enough. Um, yeah, it, it's been an absolutely wild ride, and I'm glad I was able to put this out in 4K and nice views. Thank you again to my Patreons. You guys are pretty damn amazing, and I, yeah, I really just can't thank you enough. Like, comment, subscribe. Join the Discord, don't break the rules or I will ban you myself because... Uh... And I will catch you next time. As always, shout out to all of you. Thank you so much.